it's great to be here. It's great to see everyone. Uh, but then all I did uh, was come here to just tell everybody a story. It's nothing formal, it's not a speech, it's not um, a presentation to get everybody fired up to run out of this industry and work for heritage or to join the Cabos, which is not a bad idea. I just came to tell you a story. It's a 50-year-old story of which I've been part of for maybe 20, 30, I don't really remember. But anyway, um, to introduce ICOMOS, ICOMOS stands for the International Council for Monuments and Sites. This is an international organization that, um, that regulates the heritage profession all over the world. The heritage profession, some of us think, um, has to do with only architects who cut and paste and nip and tuck old buildings like this one to put them back. Believe me, I, I do that when I put nip and tuck people because they pay much more. But anyway, um, going back to buildings, this, it's more heritage conservation is more than nip and tuck. Um, it is a big part of conservation, but then again, you cannot conserve a building, a place, a city, without knowing what its history is. So we work with historians. You need to know what its traditions are. So we work with sociologists, anthropologists, etc. Before you touch a building or a town, you need to know what laws there are. So we work with lawyers. And you need to know, is any money going to be made out of this? We like to say we're doing it for the beauty of it. That's a lot of bull, believe me. Is there money to be made out of it? So we have to work with economists, we have to work with businessmen, we have to work with those awful developers in Makati, um, because they're the ones who control. We have to work with City Hall, we have to work with Malacanian. Happily enough, Malacanian has paid no attention to us, which is why Ecomos Philippines and Philippine conservation is in such a great place. <laughs> Believe me, all over the world we are highly respected. And that's why I would like you to join ICOMOS because you get the world view. You no longer get our little Philippine island view, which is naman ganito na naman, we're losing like this. And I really don't know why the Philippine world view of itself is so small and is so black and it's so negative. When you walk out of the Philippines, everybody says, wow, Philippines. That's all, chapeau. So let's find out why. So, facts on ICOMOS, its headquarters are in Paris. There are around 110 national committees all over the world. We are one. Uh, around 7,500 members. It is run by an executive committee, of which the Philippines was a member at one time, for one third, in, uh, up to 19, up to 2003. 2000-2003. It's, the executive committee is involved the uh, all the uh, national committee presidents. There are 26 scientific committees, we'll talk about those later. And every three years there's a general assembly. The last general assembly was held in October in Florence. There was a very strong Philippine delegation of five. Four actually because this guy is the ambassador to the Philippines. He already lived there. He just drove to Florence from Rome to be with us. So four. So that's, uh, it was a strong delegation, but then later on we'll make a pitch for the next year of assembly because we should be 40. The Venice Charter actually is the um, charter that governs um, conservation worldwide. It's the basis for all of these charters, national charters, World Heritage uh, Convention, etc. The Venice Charter did not happen overnight. The story of the Venice Charter is that Warsaw, which is one of our favorite stories being denoised, we like saying Warsaw was the first most destroyed city in World War II, Manila was the second. But look at what those people in Warsaw did that we did not do. They rebuilt the center of the destroyed city stone by stone, window by window, glass pane by glass pane, word for word. Uh, 
we left our old buildings there and we moved to Quezon City and to Makati to hell with the old stuff. So anyway, um, once the once this was, once this reconstruction was done, people were asking the folks, how did you do it? So they said, you know, we did research and we learned how it was built originally. We tried to come with the original materials or duplicate the materials. We tried to build it in the same way as we did it before. Um, and so they were talking to a bunch of architects who um, said, we never knew that. So let's talk about it more. So they formalized a little more what the procedure was and kept talking more and more until about 20 years later comes the Venice Charter. That was first the Athens Charter, which happened maybe five years before the Venice Charter when architects met in, 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 in Athens and decided that it's time to get a charter going, it's time to get um, guidelines and rules, etc. going, and maybe it's time to organize a group. So five years later, um, Iconos, Iconos was born. So the Venice Charter, as we said, sets guidelines for global practice. Uh, it's great to read, by the way, just, just download it from the Iconos webpage. The Venice Charter, of course, was written in 1965. So that's a long time ago. It's older than any of my children. But um, it's the year before I graduated from college. So anyway, um, so we like also saying that it's outdated. Yes, it is. Uh, we like saying it needs to be revised. Yes, it should be. Um, and it does get revised from time to time. But you know how, if you don't know how it goes in international organizations and, and international bureaucracies like UNESCO to change a comma in any charter or any um, guideline takes at least four years. I kid you not. Things move very, very slowly. So things are still moving slowly with the bench charter, but it's evolving. So it is actually a very good basis. We should be thankful for that. We should be thankful that it is a good uh, stepping, it is a good baseline for us to evolve from. But again, one of the main things, especially for us who live in this part of the world, is the charter was done in 1965 by Europeans, oops, by Europeans who thought that outside of Europe, zero. Uh, we call that today Eurocentric. It still happens. Um, we are also Asia-centric. Um, it's just that we were talking earlier about having a world view. A lot of people don't really have that. So the first chapter of it is up to today. It's very Eurocentric. It talks about conservation in European terms, in European capabilities, in European budget, and in the European mindset. None of that works here. The story is that uh, many years ago, I was um, much younger, very fired up about heritage. I would come to the Philippines. I would um, talk to people and get them to preserve heritage for heritage sake, for the beauty of it, for the history of it, and nothing happened. I was a total failure. We'll talk about that a little later. So anyway, one of the main things people must does is it is the primary body that advises the World Heritage Committee in Paris uh, on cultural heritage matters. There are two other bodies that advise the World Heritage Committee. One is IUCN, or the International Conservation Union, which advises on natural heritage and um, ICROM, I don't know what ICROM means, but it is a training institute, uh, UNESCO affiliated in Rome that teaches conservation. So ICROM advises on training. So these are the three advisory bodies that work with the World Heritage Committee either for inscription of World Heritage sites or uh, making sure that they're maintained right or helping them to maintain. So what ECOMOS does is it advises, as I said, uh, it advises on whether a site can be inscribed or not, whether a site is ready for inscription or not, whether it is um, well maintained or not. ECOMOS sometimes is sent by the World Heritage Committee to do what is called um, a monitoring mission where you look at the site to see what its problems are and uh, recommend how it can be maintained. Of course, um, ECOMOS and World Heritage just recommends and recommends and recommends and recommends because they give you no money. 
But that is again a Filipino strength, no money. There are 26 people more scientific committees. I suggest you just download this because there are 26 of them. They go all the way for, if you like, um, International Committee on Analysis and Restoration of Structures for Engineers, um, Archaeological Heritage, Cultural Landscapes, uh, Cultural Roots, um, Cultural Tourism, uh, Earth and Architecture, economics of conservation, and so on, and so on, and so on. And it would be great if you are an Economos member to be active in one committee of your choice. It can be something that's following what you do or something that you're interested in. But the more active you are, I guess the, the thing is that uh, you get out of Economos the equal amount of what you put in. So if you're active in one committee, the, the learning and the networking and the, you know, uh, light bulb moments that come to you uh, are really worth it. Ikamos Philippines got its start, a very slow start, in around 1985. It was because uh, the Philippines was thought it would nominate sites to the World Heritage List, uh, and the World Heritage Center told them, well, why don't you open start an Ikamos Committee? So the people who started the Ikamos Committee were Ricky Jose, very famous, uh, known to many of us uh, who cannot be here today because he's doing something in USD. Um, Ramon Faustman was one of the original um, intramuros um, specialists who has now moved and live, lives in Florida and a few other people who are no longer with us. It's that long ago. Um, I was not with this first group. I was with the, the second reincarnation of Topic of Oz, which happened in the 90s. But anyway, the, what ECOMOS did in the Philippines really was to be very, very active in World Heritage, um, world heritage issues. So <clears throat> the Philippines won a seat in the World Heritage Committee in 1995 or 6. Um, immediately, we won a seat in the Bureau, which is the smaller group within the World Heritage Committee that, uh, that runs the, the, uh, the World Heritage uh, World Heritage sites, uh, world, the World Heritage, what do you call it? The Trans World Heritage Convention, actually. That's the day-to-day -day thing. Uh, and so the Philippines was there in the early days uh, of World Heritage, and we were there when World Heritage was being born, the World Heritage Convention still being formulated and being improved and being made better, and so on. So we had our toe in from the beginning. ICOMOS Philippines was also very involved in the pre-nomination uh, preparation for all of the World Heritage Sites, the first five. Pre-nomination means uh, telling the people that you have a site, number one, because they, they never think they do. They think it's awful, they think it's terrible, they think it's old, they think it's ordinary and dirty. You say it's all of the above, but it's something else. Uh, then you have to, you have to get them to realize that they need to have laws to protect their site. You have to get the people um, involved somehow uh, in protecting the site or in managing the site. You have to get the government involved. So th there are all of these steps that you have to do. Um, for Matanas, it took about 10 years, 11 years, and it still is not inscribed. So it's a step-by-step -step thing. Uh, dossier preparation, meaning you, you write out why your site should be involved, should be inscribed in the World Heritage List. You come out with a dossier that's about this thing. It's like doing a PhD dissertation. Um, and then you send it off uh, to Paris and cross your fingers because you don't know what's going to happen next. If you're lucky, you're called for uh, an evaluation mission, which means that somebody from an ECOMOS somewhere else is sent to the Philippines or to your site, wherever it is, anywhere in the world, and a local ECOMOS person more or less chaperones him and brings him around. And in the end, uh, you either get your site listed, uh, referred, meaning try again next year, you have a few periods and commas that are out of place, just fix those and send it back next year, or deferred, meaning sorry folks. Uh, but there are very few deferrals, believe me. 
because world heritage is a very inclusive process. Uh, we think that it's not very, we think that it's like, you know, this universe. Uh, may the best person win and the one who doesn't win is second best. Nobody is second best in world heritage. Everybody is first best and world heritage wants as many, as long as you qualify, to come into the list, which is the reason why now there's slightly over 1,000 sites, which is a little crazy because managing 1,000 sites uh, is very crazy. One of the main things and the earliest things that Ikomos Philippines um, participated in was the campaign for cultural landscapes. Cultural landscapes is a category uh, for World Heritage Inscription that um, talks about the union of nature and culture. So this is a landscape where you cannot separate the natural input and the cultural input, the, the input of nature and the input of man. And what better example than the rice terraces? The Philippines was very active in this because we wanted to inscribe our rice terraces, but there was no category for it to go into. So we went on a maybe five or six year campaign, um, joining all of these people, meeting in Germany, in, in, in Vermont, in wherever, until finally the World Heritage Committee recognized cultural landscapes in the 1996-98, I think, around there. Um, and then uh, the, the cultural landscapes group made a deal and said, this is, this is pure UNESCO politics, I love it. Um, they said, look New Zealand, you have Tongariro, which is a religious mountain. It has no people living in it. It is called a relic cultural landscape. Let's do you first, because you are easier for the World Heritage Committee to understand. And you, Philippines, you have the sexy one. People and animals and rice and mountain and irrigation and social system and problems with uh, neighbors fighting neighbors and mayors fighting governors. Uh, Department of Agriculture fighting Department of Environment, the Natural Environment. You be the next one. Next year, your turn because you are harder uh, for the World Heritage Committee to understand. So we did that. The World Heritage Committee understood the relic landscape, and the next, um, the net, the following year, they understood how gorgeous this place is. So we were acclaimed with huge uh, applause as the first continuing cultural landscape on the UNESCO World Heritage List, which means that this landscape has been in constant use in the same way from day one up to today. So that is um, another chapeau, another credit for us. Many of us don't know that because we think that we for maintaining the cultural landscape uh, and Malakanyang doesn't give us any support. All of, the, all of the above is true, but let me go on. And then, a few years later, we nominated the heritage city of Bigan, the historic city of Bigan. Uh, this process took about 20 years to get the nomination. This process was the most painful birth ever. It had to do with um, people fighting, people, government fighting, house owners, house owners fighting back, uh, people saying, ano ba yung heritage na yan? Uh, and so on. Ayaw namin, ni, ayaw namin gumawa ng heritage village, gusto namin ng 50-story buildings. And we looked at them and we said, a little city like yours? In Ilocos, 50-story buildings? Until finally, Butch Chelsea at one heated meeting said, what would Bigan be without its houses? And people started opening their eyes. So, Bigan becomes a World Heritage City, and like the Rice Terraces, as soon as it became a World Heritage City, World Heritage City Malacanang said, we never heard of any Bigan, we never heard of any Rice Terraces. We had a Rice Terraces Commission, it closed, Malacanang closed it, and Bigan, they said, we never promised to give you any money. So both these sites were left holding the bag with zero money. How beautiful that was. Because the people of Bigan learned they had to do it themselves. They were now uh, very, the word, the buzzword is empowered. So they were empowered, but they were very excited because they had a heritage city, finally, finally. The world knew 
that Vigan was something special. They had no money, but who cares? The mayor of Vigan at that time, when it was um, declared as a World Heritage City, had enough money in her treasury to pay the salaries for one year. I kid you not. But slowly they did it. Together they did it. Like the rice terraces uh, that also had all its, uh, the rock pulled from under its feet, together the people did it. The rice terraces had Sidmo and Teddy Magilat, who was um, a very enlightened um, NGO head for, for the same the rice terraces movement. They did the conservation themselves. Vigan did all the conservation themselves. And in the end, 2013, Vigan is, Vigan is declared by UNESCO as the most sustainable world heritage city in the world. There's no second place. There's only first place. Um, and this award will never be given again. It was, it was a special award given for UNESCO for the World Heritage uh, Conventions 30th, 50th? Uh, 2012. It, it was for the UNESCO World Heritage Conventions um, 50th, 30th, 40th anniversary. So it's never to be given again. So for you people who like to say, Kawawa tayo, we don't know what we're doing, we're losing everything day by day. People from outside say, Philippines, wow, you are the leaders in community based conservation. You have taken um, you have taught everybody how to conserve towns and cities and landscapes without a drop of national government money or with very little, I mean little, lunch money coming from UNESCO and coming from other foreign, uh, foreign organizations. So that's why it is, I, I, I can't encourage you enough to be active in an international organization because it opens your perspective. You stop saying, kawawa naman ako. Aluway ko na ako. Because uh, once you're out of here, everybody looks up to you. And believe me, it's a great feeling. I love it. So the rice terraces of the Philippine Cordilleras, because the Malacanang put the, the rug from under its feet, went into this other list, this very elite list called World Heritage in Danger, which really means intensive care. If you don't shape up, we take you off forever. Uh, it managed the rice terraces, it managed to hang on to that list for 12 years because it was doing, UNESCO would, UNESCO would say, can you do this? They would say yes, but they would have to do it slowly because they were funding themselves on a shoestring. But it finally got done. It was all community-based. Palakanyang never sent a centavo. Uh, UNESCO from, from Paris sent a few centavos. Um, a few other foreign agencies sent maybe three more centavos, but most of it was our own. It was really by sweat. And 12 years later, um, we went off the World Heritage List during the uh, World Heritage Convention meeting in St. Petersburg amid fantastic applause, and believe me, it was fantastic applause. We were hailed as the world's example for community-based conservation, how conservation can be done by a community and can be done for very little money. Because again, the European way was um, the government will subsidize us or the EU will subsidize us, um, we have, everything is very orderly, and in the Philippines, as you know, we make our order as we go. UNESCO Philippines was also invited to be a technical consultant by UNESCO. Did they say UNESCO? I said ECOMOS Philippines was invited to be a technical consultant by UNESCO after the Bohol earthquake uh, for the UNESCO rehab pro uh, projects for um, Bohol church damage. Nothing has happened yet. ECOMOS Philippines was also invited by, believe it or not, Department of Agriculture for Heritage. Uh, there is a program called Globally Important Agricultural Heritage Sites, administered by UNFAO, Food and Agriculture Organization in Rome. What this does is it identifies um, traditional agricultural sites all over the world which are still functioning today and are still producing food for people. So the rice terraces are of course one, 
Uh, and we have found many uh, interesting sites in the Philippines. One interesting one is in Bohol, the culture of growing ube. Because ube is not something that you plant and you harvest. You have special rituals to plant ube, you have special places to plant ube, uh, you have grade A, B, C, D, E, F, G ube. When you um, harvest the ube, it happens to be around November 1, so you get your biggest and best one and bring it to church and you offer it to the priest. So all the farmers offer the priest, so he has this huge stockpile of ube there uh, under his bed. But anyway, these are things that you do. Um, there are rituals that come from pre-Hispanic days on how you plant ube. How um, it is best if it's planted by a naked virgin in full moon at night. Uh, it's pro maybe it's still done, they don't want to admit. But I think it's still done in certain places in Bohol. And if you look at that ube plantation, some of them are less than 100 square meters. Some of them are only as big as this room. Um, they are, the, you pass it on the highway, you wouldn't give it a second chance. You wouldn't give it a second look. It looks so ordinary and sometimes so scraggly. But once you get into the ube story, um, it's incredible. You fall in love with it. You look at ube like you never looked at ube before. So we're doing sites for lanzones. We're doing sites for abaca. We're doing sites for bananas. We're doing, um, many, many other sites. So, uh, this is another aspect of heritage that people don't really think about. And then, like we said earlier, everybody likes to say the Charter of Venice is outdated, and it is. So, Icomos Philippines would like to do a charter for the Philippines with guidelines on construction and reconstruction tailored to our sensibility, to our um, to our way of looking, to our technology, and so on. Um, so that is probably the main project of, of EcoBoss. We are hoping that NCCA will sign that check so we can start it tomorrow. <laughs> what EcoBoss has been doing uh, a lot of in the past few years is working outside the country, telling other people, this is what we're doing, and um, Hearing from other people how great we are because we pioneered this stuff. And the other and people from the other countries have been calling Ecomos Philippines people, by the way, to go to their countries and teach them how we do things. So we have helped the rice terraces in Bali, we have helped temples in India, we have helped um, place, um, towns, historic towns in Malaysia. So um, maybe what Ecomos' um, shortcoming was that it did not managed to tell the Filipino people too clearly about how we are being regarded overseas. After today, maybe we can start telling people more. So anyway, these are the things that now the, the, the feedback comes to us that the Philippines is very well known all over the world for public-private partnership in heritage conservation. Heritage in the Philippines is really NGO-led. We have people like Ivan, who's the biggest NGO who leads things. Uh, Ivan will stand up and scream that a building is coming down, a bridge is coming down, a city is flooded, and so on. Uh, and gets more and more people to scream with him until the government comes and says, ah, oh, no, no, let's do something. Another example was um, FEU, who went on um, an urban renewal program where they first renewed their whole campus, restored it won a UNESCO award for that. And then they wanted to uh, start the renewal outside, on the street outside their, their campus on Moraita Street. Um, they called the people and they told the people, why don't you just sort of you know, paint your buildings and clean the sidewalk in front of you and so on, which the people did at very little cost. And then the next thing they did was they somehow said, let's try and organize those uh, sidewalk hawkers uh, which was terrible, they think, to do because I think they were threatened with their lives. But they did a little bit. They were able to put a little bit of order. And once they did all of that, they then went to the mayor of Manila, who was, I think, a Tienza at that time, and said, look, mayor, we did your job. We did A, B, C. You should now give us D, E, F, G, H, I, J. So they told the mayor, we need more security. We need the street to be fixed. We need this, we need that. And since it was election year, the mayor gave everything. 
and then afterwards uh, it was downhill. But anyway, that's the way we do it in the Philippines. We shame the government into doing something. We don't wait for them to start because we know better they'll never come. So we are very well known for that all over the world. We're teach we've taught the Indonesians how to do that. We've taught Malaysians how to do that. Uh, and we should shake each other's hand because we subconsciously do that every day. What to do if you're an ECOMOS member? Number one is to improve our legal framework. We need better laws. Uh, we need to improve our legal, our, our conservation laws. The second one is to professionalize because ECOMOS is the organization for professionals working in heritage, whether you're a lawyer, an accountant, a realtor, uh, architect, uh, museum worker. This is your livelihood. So professionalized means let's get paid. Let's get paid better. We are advocates, yes, but we have to have a limit between advocacy and lunch and dinner and breakfast and tuition and rent and lights and water and power. So we're professional. We need to get paid for the work we do, but we are advocates. We have a soft heart. We will do something for you up to a certain point. We have to give, we, we do give advice. We are called to give advice by many, many people from Ayala, the, Ayala Land to Manila City Hall to, yesterday I was called by the Ilocos, Ilocos, Iloilo City Hall. So, we give advice, yes. Uh, but we should give advice on the level that we are professionals, we have studied this matter, we know what we're talking about, please listen to us. This is not just uh, off the top of your head and from the top of your pants kind of advice. This is learned advice, because step two is, Mr. Mayor, I'm sending you a proposal. And advocacy. We should make all Filipinos know that we are doing great strides in heritage, even if we think we are so terrible. We have to lose something to gain something. We happen to be losing a lot, but we're gaining something anyway. What else to do? It's early enough to plan to attend the next General Assembly in Delhi, 2017. Delhi is a fabulous place, believe me. And, uh, Delhi is not what you think. Delhi is also this, my favorite buildings. Uh, the, this is the um, par uh, parliament complex by Lachens, done in the 1920s. Very classical, very colonial. Um, just anyway, it would be good to have, instead of four people like we had last year, uh, 40 people going to Delhi. So now is the time, start getting ready. Why be active in ECOMOS? We said earlier, you get exactly what you put out of it, what you put in. So it will give you, and establish, it will establish you an international network. You'll know what other people are doing. You'll know what other people are thinking so that you are abreast with the latest thinking and the latest practices. Uh, it gives you a global overview, and once you have a global overview uh, and the network, then your professional growth just really follows. And through ECOMOS, we should continue teaching people how to do conservation our own way. Whether people in Vigan, or people in Paris, or people in Oslo, or people in Bogota. This is how we do it. It works for us. We follow all the rules. We don't do it your way. We get the same results. Maybe you should think of, can we help you? Um, we can maybe open a few doors for you, open a few eyes for you. We can maybe show you how to do it cheaper. We can show you how to do it when your Malacanang does not give you a cent. So when you do ECOMOS, or when you do this type of work, sometimes you have bad days, sometimes you have good days, but then, you know, what we're doing is actually getting our dreams to come into reality. If you're ever in Kathmandu, by the way, this is one of the most fabulous places to go to. I won't tell you what's inside because it's a true surprise. <laughs> so, thank you.